welcome back to The Balance Beam. I'm your host, Nikita Thigpen. And as always, we have an awesome opportunity to interview someone dynamic, an industry expert that has spoken across the stages of this world in all the ways that she's done it through her chair practice, hitting the top people in the top places across the country, starting with Long Island, New York, because all those amazing people that she chairs has a far reach around the world. I would like to introduce to you the incredible, amazing, awesome, intelligent, delectable Diane McKilvery. Welcome to the Balance Beam. Well, thank you, Nikita. I can't remember the last time I had such a wonderful introduction. <laughs> Very happy to be here having an online conversation with you this time. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. I am super excited because you and I had such an incredible conversation almost two months ago, I think at this point, and it was infectious. I knew I needed to get you on the balance beam somehow, some way in the middle of a really busy schedule that you have. So thank you. My pleasure. <laughs> Tell everybody more about the incredible things that you do. Of course, Vistage is just one major thing that you do, but fill us all in because I know that they have no idea. <laughs> well, after uh, a long and, and very happy career uh, in businesses ranging from uh, large corporate to small business and startups, um, I joined uh, Vistage as a chair, mm -hmm. uh, and the main purpose for my joining uh, was really twofold. One, I wanted to give back. It was my turn, I felt. Um, and of course, you accumulate quite a bit of knowledge, but the more that you realize uh, in a long corporate career. And I wanted to be able to share that. I wanted to be able to pay it forward. I mean, that's a little bit of a uh, colloquialism, but it um, has been one of the most satisfying parts of my career. I've been doing it now for five years, and I work with executives all over the island, mm -hmm. uh, both chief executives, owners, presidents, and their key executives. And um, I also do a program inside a single organization. It's a peer advisory format, and I know that you know, just by knowing about you, that understand that you put 12 people in a room that are all from different uh, organizations, different, not a competitor in the room, mm -hmm. and you begin to share war stories and issues and challenges and how you individually have dealt with those same challenges. And it is a pretty powerful session. And we do that monthly with CEOs. Um, I chair a women's group, WPO, a phenomenal organization of women uh, with businesses um, of a million dollars or more. It's the same peer advisory format, and it is a, um, a, a form that women feel safe in. They like to share with other women, and uh, that's been a very, very uh, broadening experience for me as well. Uh, I'm a writer. I do resumes and LinkedIn profiles and marketing letters and business plans and strategic plans and marketing communications. I write. I love to write. Mm -hmm. I have done resumes in particular for at least 30 years. And um, it allows me, allows my creative juices to you know, come out because resume is really nothing more than a story. Right. If I were doing a bio for an Akita Think Pen, I would need to know all about what makes you tick, not just the black and white, not just the, these are my skills, these are my accomplishments, but who are you? And why do I want to know you? And so that's always fun. Um, I recently did a resume for a uh, Navy SEAL, and I just felt honored uh, to be able to do that. It was quite uh, an experience. And every resume required for search. Um, I think I've done resumes in about every industry. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, um, and that's exciting as well. And I'm an author, and uh, I keep busy. <laughs> I keep to, myself to say the least. <laughs> You, you are very busy, which is incredible and expected, I have to say, considering your background. 
Um, and I've had the privilege to be able to see not only your bio, but to really go through your LinkedIn profile, which is very well done. So it makes sense that you do that for other people. Um, it's You have a, such an exquisite story just in the life that you live professionally. Just speaking from that level, from all the the marketing management, you know, raising capital 30 plus percent for $400 million businesses. I mean, this is not small potato stuff at all. I aspire, okay? Let me say that. <laughs> it's incredible. Your story is phenomenal. And you are what I would, con what I would consider to be a superwoman. And I mean that with love, because I know some people say, oh, I'm not a superwoman. And I've even said it myself, like, let me put my cape down. But I learned to embrace it. You know, I am a super amazing person, not because I'm special, but because I was put here to empower other people beyond myself. And that's really what that is for me. And you have to really put on your cape, put yourself aside to really go and help other people in such a significant and impactful way, especially what you do with really major people in Vistage. Um, that's incredible because we're not talking about, you know, startups, although that's awesome because obviously we were all startups at one point. We started up four years ago, but you're looking at million plus dollars, upwards of 25 plus million dollar businesses and getting those CEOs in the room to trust you, to know you, to like you, to share not just head logic stuff, but heart stuff that affects them in their daily balance every day that's amazing well and you know we um when we select members and we, we do select members very carefully mm -hmm. uh we like people we define them as green and growing um because we all can learn every day from one another yeah. and so it's very important that people are willing to be vulnerable so that they can learn and they can share uh but you, but you hit on something before that it, it, part of my personal belief system and that is that you're absolutely right this is not I'm not a superwoman I have some talent that you know I is God-given mm -hmm. and it's not for me to go off or to strut my stuff it's for me to do good with and um, you know I was raised that way I mean that was uh, always kind of a cornerstone of our family values and it is a driving force and for that reason, you do go that extra mile because you figure, you know what, I might not have the opportunity again to touch this person in this way. And so I I have to do that. It's, mm -hmm. it's something that I, I gain great satisfaction out of, don't get me wrong, but it's not for my own personal information. Absolutely. I it was fine, but now I'm, I'm just in a different place at the moment. Yeah, you've grown. Talk about green and growing, right? To, to use your language. It matters when you can look back at your life and say, here are the mistakes I made, even from a uh, place of intention. You did great things, but maybe as you grew um, in yourself and in the knowledge of who you are and who you're supposed to be, you learned that maybe all those intentions weren't in alignment with where you should have been. Speaking specifically about myself, I had to realize that about myself as a giver. I am a giver all day long. It's an innate part of me. It is tethered to my soul. But I had to look back, this was some years ago, and realize that some of my giving wasn't with the greatest intention. Although I always gave with no expectation to get back, I never, it would bother me if someone said, oh, Nikita gave me this. I'm like, don't tell people that. You know, I, you know, I want to give from my heart. And I meant that but I was still actually giving to fill a void in myself, which was a different intention than if you gave to fill a void in someone else. So you yes. made a good point. That is, that is a totally different intention, you're absolutely right. And I think it's easy to get caught up in doing something with all good intentions, but also doing it primarily for your own sense of fulfillment and achievement, mm -hmm. as opposed to investing in somebody in a way that is absolutely no strings attached and no expectation of personal aggrandizement or, or even personal satisfaction, although you can hardly avoid that right. when you're up with somebody. Right. And I know for you, just being familiar with the Vistage platform myself, it's important when you have the trust of so many 
impactors in in your care and i know you have several vistage groups that you run and that you care for when you're caring for an impactor but you know the things that you say the way that you um, share with them the way that you impact those impactors they're now going to go out in their own ripple effect and affect not only their companies but their wives spouses children uh, other relationship partners, all of those things in such a, an, an intricate way that you have to be really mindful of how you get refueled and how you're, you're recharging yourself so that you're not impacting them in a negative way. Because as a friend of mine likes to say, you're not putting something in their bag that doesn't belong to them because you had a bad day. You're showing up, you know, impacting them in an un unhealthy way. Well, and I will tell you that, um, Growing up in corporate America really sensitized me to that fact. I can recall, you know, it, it, you get so much training in, when you're working for large corporations, and it's wonderful. And I will always remember um, a training program that talked about, you know what, you're going to have good days, you're going to have bad days, but you've got clients, and those clients need 100% of you, not 95, not 85, not 60. They need to know that you're there and you're focused on them 100% of the time. And so we used to laugh and somebody come in and say, oh, you know, I, I, I crashed my car, you know, my dog, you know, fell in the water, I, uh, the toaster broke. And we just turn and say, it sounds like a personal problem, leave it at home. And um, that is so ingrained in me mm -hmm. because you almost need to compartmentalize um, your, you know, personal professional life. Now, I will tell you that on occasion, a member uh, would say, there's something off with you today. What is the matter? And the thing that's interesting about that is that I am a servant leader. I am with my clients to uh, promote their growth and development, promote, promote the growth and development of their businesses. But when somebody is that sensitive to be able to read that, because I'm pretty deadpan, <laughs> you know that, you know that you've got a special person on the other end. It's very, um, very broadening in many, many respects, personally. Uh, and it's fun. That's the other thing. You know, it's not all serious stuff. Oh my These guys can get pretty funny, and, and uh, the ladies as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can imagine the stories that show up because they're all leaders in their own right, not just in the definition of a traditional leader, but in the role that they walk in from their businesses. They're not necessarily always the ones doing uh, the details um, not sometimes they're not even the ones managing the detail providers if you will um, and there has to be something to be said for someone who has an eagle's view of their company and all the different things that are happening from the business development aspect through marketing and negotiations or contracting or the crazy things that happen on the golf court I can just golf course <laughs> clearly I'm not a sports girl <laughs> that happens well, and I think, um, you know, when you see these people in operation, um, they are business people, mm -hmm. but they're always also family people, mm -hmm. and they're also people that have many, many problems that have to be dealt with. Um, so it is, uh, it's never dull, and those that are in my group, I will tell you one of the main criteria for people in my group is that they're nice people. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I'm not a remediator. Mm -hmm. I don't look at businesses that are about to fold and mm -hmm. say, come on, fix that. Because then I can't provide as much value to the broadest audience. And so when I look at filling a group or, or within the Vistage community, one of the things we look at is what you pointed out before, and that is if a member being part of one of my groups becomes a better leader, starts to make decisions then who is that member touching so it's like a thousand points of light mm -hmm. so we can get to a very small community proportionally and touch hundreds of people in in the leaders personal and professional lives I and mean, it's it's uh, pretty powerful that is more than powerful so what are you doing when you have you know, you're dealing with a lot of issues because I know you have the group peer advisory dy dynamic, but you also have these individual opportunities to really truly connect 
with those individual CEOs and company leaders. And because you have so many group also trusted advisors and key advisors um, in that, how are you making sure that some of the negative, really profound situations, personally and professionally, that you are in the space to receive that they don't start to infect you in a way because it's very easy to to grab onto those stories those realities and they go home with you at night how do you make sure that you detoxify yourself and just take care of you well years ago i had the unfortunate occasion to be in a children's cancer group uh for several weeks and I overheard a conversation between a mother who was in agony um, Mm -hmm. and her child's doctor. And the doctor came in and said, oh, it's wonderful. We're getting more children in our presenting like your daughter. And, you know, that'll help us research it and find the cure. And the mother turned to the doctor and said, doctor, this is not a lab rat. This is my daughter. And without skipping a beat, he said, he said, you're a negative business world right now. And he said, if I get emotionally involved with your child or the child in the bed next to your child, then I can't do my job and I can't help hundreds of children. Mm-hmm. And he understood. And I understood. And so similarly, but certainly typically in a much less, uh, you know, life-threatening uh, situation, I can't internalize everything that goes on in exchanges, mm-hmm. both one off and with my members in group meetings, or I can't be effective. And so I have to almost become, and I've always remembered that exchange, I almost have to become the clinician in the room. Um, doesn't mean I don't love my members or care about them or uh, become available to them at not a minute's notice, but it does mean that I can't absorb all of their heartache when it happens. Otherwise, I'd be I'd be out of business by now. I promise you. No, absolutely, um, and that's such a good reference for everyone listening because that's one of the things that we've had to describe to people and help them understand. Like, I'm a licensed clinical social worker by profession and will always be that to the day I die. Um, and my background and expertise is trauma. So trauma and relationship management. And often what I hear from people is like, oh, Nikita, you coach? Oh, so are you diagnosing them too? Because I saw your bio, you're a clinician. I'm like, no, those clinical skills help me in my coaching to make sure that there's no transference and and counter cross transference because it's important to not absorb those things. Not that you're desensitized, which I'm glad you were careful to say. Like you're not putting up a barrier where you're not aware and recognizing that there are some emotions attached to these experiences. If you're making a a big choice, especially in successorship, which I think you said before that you've kind of dealt with mergers, acquisitions, and some successorships. Yeah, that's that's big, especially if it's a family-run company um, or there's some relationship there because these people have been there for 20, 30 years and now because of a merger and acquisition there's a big shift in positions roles titles or employment that ceo who's confiding in you saying listen diane this is this is big stuff you know i've worked with bob or julie or or jasmine for 30 years this is hard for me to walk in there tomorrow and you know, deliver the message that the company's changing, being rebranded, some roles are happening. For you not to recognize the emotion would be something different. So I'm glad you you mentioned that. Well, and I'll tell you in that vein that um, one of the biggest challenges for people selling their businesses today, so the you know late 50s, early 60s generation, is their loyalty. They have a very difficult time. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, uh, Nancy helped start the company, and she did all the invoicing, and now I'm selling the company, or now my, my son is running the company, and he's saying, but Nancy is no longer, you know, contributing to the same value of her salary level, so how do we, you know, write that? So, very, very challenging, no question about it, and you do, um, you do need to remind um uh, businessmen who are selling that, you know, 
Nancy is somebody who's very valuable to you. And you have every right. I tell people, you have every right to continue to pay Nancy if you want to do that. But keep in mind, too, that it is a indication of how much you're really going to let your son or your daughter take over your business. So it's not a, a cut and dry uh, answer. But I see it all the time. I see it all the time. Very, very loyal people. And they don't believe that they did this all by themselves. I will also tell you that the, the CEOs that I come in contact for the most part are very humble individuals. They don't believe they know everything. I had one CEO say to me, you know, Diane, he said, I feel sometimes that I'm standing in front of a window and I'm blocking the view for my whole team. Mm. And they're fine with that because mm. they think I can see out of it and that I have all the visibility and the vision. He said, I don't always have that vision. <laughs> you know? So it's a big responsibility. And um, people look at CEOs with great expectations. There's a lot of burden on their shoulders. There really is. Absolutely. I have to ask you, um, curious, because this has come up for lots of high pressure positioned individuals. And of course, and I use that term instead of just leaders, because some people identify leadership with a specific title. And I know you don't just from our previous conversations, but those who are in those high pressure positions across the board from from management all the way up, imposter syndrome. Um, you made me think of it when you mentioned the, the CEOs being a, a place of humility and sometimes feeling like they're blocking the view because they're not necessarily sure, uh, sure of themselves. Do you come across that at all when you're doing your peer advisory or one-to-one -one or even um, in your, your WPO, your Women's Professional Organization Group? Have you experienced that? I come across it all the time. It's very common uh, because, again, when you think of how a small business starts, somebody has an idea or something they'd like to do, and they start to go out and sell it personally because they can't afford a national sales manager and, you know, city of and all those rules, and they go out. Well, that passion and that love is what got them started, mm -hmm. but it's not enough to create a business. And so over time, yes, they begin to add skill sets. They begin to pull away from being everything to everybody, the payroll clerk, the, the controller, the operations guy, the sales guy. Um, and as a result, they just believe that they don't know what they don't know. In the meantime, of course, they've launched a business. They've done what so many people have absolutely not been successful at. Um, and so when you point that out to them, depending upon where they are in the maturity of their business, they begin to believe it or it only gets worse and they don't believe that they have any talent that they can do anything but so it's uh it is a very very common and it does as you point out does go on with the humility aspect do you feel like you see that more in your wpo group with the women or less or there's no real difference you just see it equally I across the board difference. Okay. i i see a discernible difference mm -hmm. i'm all I do think that women who um, have been in business for a while take the opportunity more to pat themselves on the back. I think, and I think that's important. Um, I think that it is more common, in my experience, to see women who do that than, than males who do it. To say thank you, Nikita, for doing an incredible job. <laughs> Think that they understand more the importance of that. Yeah. You know, women have some very discreet advantages in the workplace and in running a business, and I think that's one of them. They do have that that sensitivity. They may work, you know, till they're you know, they're falling, collapsing on their desk, but they also recognize that it's important for them to take that break to create that balance. Because if they don't, what was the point in the first place of mm -hmm. doing that? No, I, I totally agree. Women get it um, in a different way. You know, there are some men, and I see it more now kind of as a, an up-and-coming trending topic where uh -huh. men are starting to really embrace um, a sense of work-life balance that they hadn't before. 
Um, and I'm not really sure why the trend, why the change. So that's something that I'm personally, because, you know, I'm addicted to all things balance. Um, I'm really curious as to why that is. But women seem to really embrace the understanding that you literally have to take permission to pause. You don't do it as often as you should. Um, we, we're usually last on the list if we're on the list at all. But we know we're supposed to be on the list. Which we is understand. Different. Yeah. We don't always do it, but we do understand it. I would add, too, that I think, um, to your point about some uh, executives understanding better the importance of life balance, I would tell you this generation of millennials has it down pretty well. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes they get kind of a bum rap because they they were the ones that always got trophies if they showed up, and so they want recognition, they want, you know, promotion. What? This is a very, very talented generation yes. all they want to do is learn all they want to do is be challenged and they don't want to adhere necessarily to a nine-to-five schedule but when you understand how they work they may be on you know texting at you know six o'clock in the morning on some business matter they may hit the gym at nine and get into work at ten you can still find them there at seven or eight and they may also be emailing at, at midnight so I think this generation has a lot to learn because the millennials will comprise more than half of the population in, by the year 2020. So there's going to need to be some adjustments in the workplace, but I'm betting that these kids are going to do just fine. It'll be different, but it's going to be powerful because they're smart, smart people and they're hardworking. Absolutely, Diane. I always say that these, um, the millennial generation um, is brilliant. They are completely brilliant. One, because they have access to things at such an earlier age than we did from the technology to the accessing the information with technology. Um, But they literally infuse, pun intended, they infuse balance into their life um, because they don't have traditional schedules. They don't care for it. They don't want it. And it, it drives us a little crazy because we're a generation of planners and schedulers and organizers. <laughs> and how could they behave like this? But I think another influencing factor, too, is that they saw us killing ourselves and said, mm-hmm. no, I don't want that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I admire that and I admire the hard work and the, you know, the work ethic, but it's, it can't be 24 7. And I think that's influenced them. And I think they're doing very well with it, frankly. I have to say. Yeah, they're they're well, that's where you say smart. They are smart because they're learning to work smarter. They're still working hard, but they're working hard in a smarter way. Um, yes. which I take no credit for that statement. Um, Rob Cologne, who was an expert that we just aired a few weeks ago, he said that and I was like, Yeah, good way to put that. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's awesome. So What's your favorite place to stay um, that you would recommend anywhere in the world? It can be from your backyard through another country that you would recommend for any balance beamer who's listening, who really just needs to take their own permission to pause. I would strongly consider Tuscany. Ooh. I rent a farm ranch. You can find them on the internet in international rentals. And I would rent a motorcycle or a Vespa and I would make day trips to Florence and Siena, Chianti, Monte Cristiano, and just spend a month. That is my dream trip. It is on my bucket list. Okay. Um, I, last time we went, um, of all the places we went, I really enjoyed that because that is, I mean, Rome is not exactly a balanced environment, okay? Mm-hmm. But Tuscany, you can be cooking in a farm ranch overlooking beautiful Tuscan landscape, or you can jump on a train or a Vespa or an automobile and, and go into a city, a major city for a day. So you've got that best of both worlds without having to worry about getting up at six o'clock to catch the tour bus to go. No, that's not balance. It's not a vacation for me anyway. So that would be my recommendation. No, that's a great point. Uh, My husband and I just came off of our anniversary staycation. (laughs) Um, So we didn't get to to get a Vespa and travel across different countries, but we definitely took that same advice of just enjoying the time and making sure that you're not getting stuck in more schedules and planning tours and 
you know, yes. it's just important to not get stuck in someone else's grind. Um, Absolutely. While you enjoy yourself, it's important. Yeah. I totally agree. Speaking of which, what are you doing these days to reconnect with yourself and those who you care about in your in your life so you can reconnect and have more balance? Well, I have actually plenty of opportunity because, unfortunately, two of my children are out of state. And so we make frequent trips. And they could be long weekends. They could just be a Saturday and Sunday. But we thoroughly enjoy that. Um, just um, one, my son and his wife and my two grandchildren live in Graysonville, Maryland. Oh. And my daughter lives in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's fun just going back and forth. And we have one daughter living at home in the door. So we do a lot of things with her as well, particularly on Long Island. I mean, we've had some beautiful weekends. So we take advantage of those. I, I try very hard. I'm not always successful, but I try very hard to keep the weekends free. That's been kind of a, a hallmark and kind of my own personal standard. So I am typically able to do that. That, uh, that makes for a lot of balance. Well, that makes a lot of sense. That's kind of your non-negotiable, which I think we should all have in in every area of our life. There should be some things that there is there is an exception. You know, if you had to touch the weekend because of a family matter or a work matter, you would. But that's an exception and not the rule. And that's kind of your non-negotiable. Is this is the time that I need to refuel myself, which is really important. I like well, that. Yes, you need to. I mean, if you're always dragging with <laughs> anger, you, you can't be as effective. It's just not possible. Well, we need you to be effective because literally you are impacting the impactors. So we need you to keep doing that in the healthy, energetic, robust, alert way as you have been doing so well. Tell everyone how they can connect with you if they want to follow up with you to learn more about Vistage, if they feel like they would qualify to potentially be selected as a part of one of your teams or if they just want to connect with you for resumes or other things. Yes, I can be reached at dfmackelry at gmail.com. My uh, phone number is 631-587-2290. And if I can add the key to that, on uh, September 29th, uh, I am having a kind of an expose on all things listed. Ooh. I'm actually starting another group on Long Island for businesses between $3 million and $20 million in annual revenues. I think it's an underserved population mm -hmm. on the island. Mm -hmm. Particularly when you consider that 96% of small businesses are a million dollars or less. So this is uh, a little bit of that, but I will be having uh, an event there at the Fox Hollow. And if uh, anybody out there would like to come and hear about Eastage and actually experience a issue processing session live, uh, we will be doing that at a, at a breakfast meeting on the 29th at Fox Hollow. So. No, I'm so grateful that you mentioned that because issue processing is major and that system, although very proprietary, is incredible. I've had the liberty of sitting amongst them and they, they are very amazing. So that right. is something you all need to follow up with if you're between those guidelines of a three plus million dollar company. Um, small business and upwards and if you need more information we'll make sure that all of Diane's contact information so if you're driving please do not try to write this down you can always check the comment section later <laughs> and we'll have that information for you <laughs> we've had some special stories already but I had to pull over the car like I'm grateful you did that <laughs> Exactly, on every level. Well, Diane, you stay right there. Balance Beamers, don't move. We have more tools for you to infuse. This has been an incredible moment with Diane McKildry. I love saying her name like that. Do you like I say McKildry? You like it? Um, <laughs> stay right there, everyone. We have more tools for you to infuse in just a moment. Thank you, Nikita. You're welcome. Welcome back to another empowerment moment brought to you just for you. I want to take a second and just tell you about the most important mint moment that I have for this century. 
It's deciding on what you want, what you really want from this world, what you want out of it, and then getting out the way so you can make room to receive it. We are our biggest barriers. We are our hugest, largest challenge ever that's interrupting the flow between success and receiving as well as giving because we stand in the way of everything we want to do. Our mindsets are fixated on things that they shouldn't be. We're comparing, we're competing, we're constantly looking at the negatives. We're calling ourselves realistic when we're really just being pessimistic. We're standing in the way of our success because we're not really envisioning what we want. We're still thinking about what others want or expect of us. So I challenge you to really look at what you want and then get out the way so you can make room to receive it. I really hope that you receive of nothing else this empowerment moment.